And this is a special edition, part of CBS News' continuing coverage of the blackout of 2003. Much of the northeastern United States is without power tonight. Millions and millions of people in big cities and suburbs from New York to Detroit and in Canada were caught by surprise in the middle or late afternoon when the electrical grid suddenly crashed, stopping everything that depends on electricity to run. Here in New York City, the only thing to do was walk. Workers, those not trapped in buildings, high-rise or otherwise, or subways, flooded into the streets trying to make their way home. Post 9-11, the first thing everybody asked was, is terrorism behind us? The answer, officials say, absolutely, positively, no. But they are not sure yet exactly what knocked the power out. CBS News has a team of correspondents deployed to bring you full coverage of this still developing story. We begin here in New York with Jim Axelrod. There's limited communications here in the tri-state area. If New York City is not completely paralyzed tonight, the going couldn't be much slower. With no power at rush hour and the police stretched thin enough at points that pedestrians are directing traffic, it's massive gridlock. The cell phone's not working, telephone's not working. It's like you're in the wilderness, you know, and this is New York City. At this point, it's suspected a power plant problem in Buffalo shut down power in the New York City metropolitan area and up the eastern seaboard into Canada, as far west as Detroit. You can see the gridlock on all the downtown streets here. This is what Cleveland looked like, where power was out as far as Akron, hospitals on backup generators, and the train to the suburbs were down. Underground in New York City, in the subways, alarms sounded and people were pulled to safety. The lights started blinking. The train starts. Then all of a sudden, all the lights went on. They told us it was the AC failure. Then they told us it was the DC failure. Then they told us it was the citywide failure. People started to panic. You know, like, we couldn't breathe. With the 7 million people who use the subways in New York needing to find another way home, the streets and sidewalks quickly jammed with people walking across bridges and out of Manhattan in a state of confusion. Just kind of... Like all these other people, just looking around, don't know what's going on, don't know what happened. The last time New Yorkers saw pictures like these was the first thought on many minds. It's creepy. I'm getting a flashback from September 11th. I don't like this. I mean, the first thing that hit me was 9-11. I thought something was wrong. I got a little nervous. But fairly quickly, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission said it was not terrorism. And the mayor of New York agreed. We have a careful plan, which we've rehearsed and practiced to deal with exactly this emergency. And as of this moment, virtually everything that we had expected to be able to do, we have done. Of course, the number one question now is when is the power going to come back on? That depends on what part of the Northeast you're talking about. There are reports in Ohio that it's already on. The mayor of New York is talking about a few hours. The man who runs the utility in Detroit says maybe longer, late this evening, possibly into early morning. But Dan, at this point, everyone's talking about hours, not days. Dan? Jim Axelrod reporting live from the streets of New York. Now, the region stricken by this power outage is enormous. It runs from New York, extending north at least 300 miles to the Canadian capital of Ottawa, and west nearly 500 miles to Toledo, Ohio, including Detroit, Cleveland, and other cities. Large parts of New Jersey and Connecticut are also affected. But, and this is important, while a very widespread area is affected, most of the country is not, nor is it expected to be affected. The outlook is that this will be confined to the northeast part of the United States. Other sections of the country will not be affected, at least not directly. CBS's Anthony Mason is here on the set with you now to tell what's happening outside of New York. Anthony? Dan, the reports are scattered, but they are coming in from all over the Northeast. In Detroit, the first the power company, Detroit Edison, knew of the power outage was when their own building went dark. The city was reporting five-hour traffic delays and bridges from Detroit to Canada are reportedly gridlocked. In Erie, Pennsylvania, rolling blackouts have caused a chaotic rush hour. Even Governor Ed Rendell visiting the city was stranded in traffic. In Cleveland, University Hospital was operating in disaster mode. 
no staff could leave. A nurse in the labor room said they were without air conditioning and, quote, our laboring moms are suffering. In Hartford, Connecticut, power was been, has been flashing in and out. Forty trains in the state are stranded between stations. Akron, Ohio is without power, and four nuclear plants in Ohio and New York have been shut down. Every prison in New York State reported a loss of power and switched to backup generators. Air travel in the Northeast has ground to a halt, causing disruptions across the country. Airports in New York, Cleveland, Detroit, Ottawa, and Toronto have grounded flights, causing a snowball effect of delays. The FAA says air traffic control centers are still in business, some on backup diesel generators. The problem is with electricity out at some airports, X-ray machines and scanners aren't working, and it's impossible for screeners to check passengers. Finally, the New York Stock Exchange managed to shut down before the blackout, but officials could not say whether the markets will open normally tomorrow. Dan. Anthony Mason, thanks. Let's talk about telephones. Cell phone uh, systems got overloaded. They, they weren't knocked out. They got overloaded, but the landlines seemed to work pretty well. They have been working pretty well, Dan. Thanks, Anthony. The federal government, including the Department of Homeland Security, uh, was taken by surprise by this. It, the government moved immediately into action, among other things, to try to determine what was behind the blackout. Was it terrorism? The answer appears to be now clearly no. But for that part of the story, we go to Washington and CBS News correspondent Cheryl Atkinson. Cheryl? Well, here in D.C., Dan, you can imagine officials were watching carefully, waiting, wondering two things, of course. First of all, what caused the outage in other places? And secondly, was something like that going to also happen here? It didn't. And within about an hour and a half of the blackout, a senior White House administration official had issued a statement saying that the outage was a result of a power grid failure and not terrorism. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security quickly concurred, and so there was no change in the national security alert level. It remains as it was before, which is yellow or elevated. There was a sense of calm, not urgency from the start, from the White House personnel traveling with President Bush. He's on a trip out in California. And power went out after the markets closed, so the Treasury Department here in Washington said that the shutdown of the market participants and the exchanges was very orderly and no data was lost. The New York Stock Exchange says it will open tomorrow morning. We don't have word yet on the other markets. But in D.C., I guess you could say a big sigh of relief, not only to have not been affected by the outages here, but also to know that the terrorism was not at any root cause of this. Dan? Cheryl Axison reporting live from our Washington Bureau, emphasizing the power is on in Washington, D.C. Now, with the power out in a wide section of the upper northeast United States, centered, if you will, basically around New York City and around the Great Lakes, the only way for most people to get around in the area turns out to be on foot. CBS News correspondent Mika Brzezinski is on the sidewalks of New York. Mika? Well, Dan, at first it's safe to say there was a wave of fear that swept over the crowds that poured out into the street uh, when this first happened. It went from information center of the world to no phone service, no computers, no cell phones, and very little options in terms of getting around. In fact, we spoke to some people who were stuck in the subway when the lights went out. The next thing you know, we had to get out the train, walk through the tunnel and all that. And then no cabs want to stop us. They don't want to take us uptown. So I guess we just stuck here. I think it's very scary for the city. It's very congested. No, no lights are going on. And uh, the traffic is, is traffic's going on. It's very dangerous. We really don't know what's going on. Could be worse. In fact, the entire city is really jammed at this point. Subway service is out. Bridges and tunnels are jammed. Some bridges are being used only as a pedestrian walkway. Hours into this situation, Dan, the mood has moved from anxiety, mass anxiety, to massive inconvenience. The streets are filled with thousands of people. The only way to get around is through the express bus service. And of course, there's not enough of them to accommodate all the people who need to get where they need to go. Now, at this point, the concern the concern is what happens tonight if this situation prolongs. The concern, of course, will be looting, widespread looting and crowd control. But so far, so good right now. People are really listening to what authorities have to say. They're just trying to get home or to get to a place where they can hang out for a few hours till this all calms down. One guy, Dan, just yelled from his car to me, tell my wife I'll be home just a little bit late tonight. So people are trying to take it uh, with a, a good mood here at this point, trying to get through this very difficult commute. Dan. Mika Brzezinski reporting live from near Columbus Circle here in New York City. 
Now, we haven't heard from President Bush uh, since this situation started, and the reason is he's on a trip to California. He spoke to some Marines, Naval officers, uh, Navy personnel, and Coast Guard people this afternoon, and was is scheduled to attend a big fundraiser in uh, California tonight, so that's the reason he hasn't been in Washington. But one of our White House correspondents, Bill Plant, is traveling with the uh, president in California and is now up with the report. Bill? Well, Dan, the president was eating lunch with some of the troops when the blackout hit, and he didn't hear about it until a little bit after that. The White House, of course, initially very concerned to know whether this was a terrorist act. And when they established fairly quickly that it did not appear to be, the president was informed, and they decided that Chief of Staff Andrew Card, who was back in Washington, would be the point man, a point of contact between the traveling White House out here on the West Coast and the people involved in New York. And as you know, the White House Chief of Staff did talk to Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Pataki in New York. The president has had nothing to say on this and probably won't since it appears to be an accident. He is going ahead with his schedule, which, as you mentioned, includes a big fundraiser tonight in San Diego, $2,000 a plate, where he's expected to raise another million. Dan? Uh, Bill, first of all, you said that Andrew Card, who's a White House uh, official, but not an elected official, will be in charge, the point man, if you will, the point man for this. Uh, where is Vice President Cheney, and why wouldn't he be in charge since the president is not in Washington? Well, Dan, when last heard from, Vice President Cheney was on vacation in Wyoming. I believe he's still there. Uh, but Andy Card is at the White House and presumably closer to the center of the uh, operations with the Homeland Security people and can keep the traveling White House informed. And he was the one who uh, did talk to the officials in New York. Any serious uh, thought given to the president canceling his appearance at that uh, big fundraising, uh, campaign fundraising dinner tonight, given the fact that uh, so many millions of people are going through this in the Northeast? Dan, not that we have heard. We're attuned to the possibility of that, but there's absolutely no indication so far that he intends to cancel. He does intend, as far as we know, to go ahead with that fundraiser. Bill Plant with the traveling White House and President Bush in California. Thanks, Bill. The blacked out areas include Connecticut. And we take you now to Hartford, Connecticut, and reporter Paisy Chang of CBS affiliate WFSB. Hey? Dan, I'm actually here in New Haven at Union Station, and obviously the biggest concern for the people here are the hundreds of commuters that head into New York every day via the Metro North Railroad. Now, if you take a look over here to my right, you can see some people are waiting by their cars. That is the waiting game that dozens of people have been playing here today as they came to Union Station waiting to pick up their loved ones. Now, obviously, there is a little bright side to this. We were just told by a DOT representative that diesel-powered fuel trains are going to be going over to those Metro North trains and dragging them and rescuing them back here to Union Station. The problem you see, Dan, is here at Union Station there is electricity. However, the overhead power line for the Metro North Railroad system from New York all the way to New Haven is completely dead, and that's why all those people are stranded in between. For people who are looking to leave New Haven to head to other points further west or east, they're told they're going to have to hop on a bus, and that's what hundreds of people have been doing here. That's the latest from New Haven. Haven, Paisy Chang, CBS News. Uh, Paisy, if you're still there, please. Uh, is power on anywhere in that vicinity at the moment? I'm a little unclear what the situation is at the moment. Well, here at Union Station, power has been on for the past couple of hours. It's just various parts of Connecticut, about more than 180,000 people actually are uh, without power right now throughout the state of Connecticut. That affects places like Litchfield County, Fairfield County. Hartford and New London County. They're monitoring the situation right now. We are also told that here that the New Haven power plant, they are on standby. They still they haven't had any problems with power outages there, but just in case since everyone else seems to be affected. Thank you very much, Paisy Chang in uh, the Connecticut telling the situation there. It's a spotty situation in Connecticut, but some of the power is off there. Usually night and day, Times Square here in New York City radiates energy as the, the heartbeat of the city. This evening, though, the pulse is a little slower, as we hear now from Jim Acosta. As if someone turned a switch, the lights went out on Broadway. Suddenly, the glittering billboards along the Great White Way were dark. At the crossroads of the world, the traffic lights were off. People streamed out of skyscrapers onto the streets. 
This man walked down 45 flights. Uh, I, I hit a button on my computer and everything went out. Uh, that's what it seemed like, but I, the entire building is out. People waiting on subway platforms came up for air. Can you tell me what you saw? It kind of, it was like a flash and the light went off and the, 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 the train just stopped. Everyone screamed and then it was quiet and then people ran for the stairs. Some didn't know what had happened. They were asking me for information. Have you heard anything confirmed or different? I haven't heard anything about no. that. With subways out of commission, thousands were looking for a way home. They attempted to call on cell phones, but there was sporadic service. Business owners scrambled to save what they could. At this store, they had to go back to the old-fashioned way of keeping food cool, on ice. Jim Acosta, CBS News, New York. Jim Acosta reporting from here in New York City. We're going to go back to Washington, D.C. now for Cheryl Atkinson. And one reason we're going to go back, uh, Cheryl, first of all, Cheryl, if there's any new information to report, please pass it along. But we heard Bill Plant uh, report that uh, President Bush uh, there in Southern California was going to go ahead with his uh, campaign, uh, re-election campaign fundraiser tonight. But the, I asked him about the Vice President Cheney. So far as uh, Bill said he knew, Vice President Cheney is still on vacation uh, in Wyoming. So Andy Card, Andrew Card, chief of the White House staff, will be in charge. Any concern in Washington, at least for the, about the appearance of this, that both the president and the vice president are, if you will, offline, and so uh, the chief of White House staff is in charge? No one has said anything about that in particular, and Andrew Card was not the person that spoke to us directly in issuing statements about whether or not this was terrorism and ultimately saying it was not. Um, I think the White House, it appears to us, is trying hard to give the sense of calm rather than a sense of urgency or panic. And it seems as though their standard operating procedure would be to continue with business as usual and everything as originally planned rather than giving any sort of appearance of, of disruption, panic, or urgency. Cheryl Atkinson in Washington, thanks. Most people in the blackout areas have faced aggravating but relatively minor inconveniences. But for health officials, it can be life or death. Aaron Moriarty went to see how one New York City hospital faced the emergency, Aaron. Well, Dan, if any good came out of 9-11, it does seem that New Yorkers seem calm and prepared for emergencies. Although there was that moment of panic for people like Sanovi Abramson, whose mother was in the middle of kidney surgery at Roosevelt Hospital when the power went out. But she's very sick, and I, I'm not even sure she's going to make it through this. I watched her be rolled in personally at 3.30. At 3.30, and the in, power went out 45 minutes later. Right. And he said it would take approximately 40 minutes to an hour and a half. Well, you never know. I mean, who knows? I mean, you're not going to hold anybody to that. But I'm assuming that he, she was right in the middle of surgery. But moments later, her mother's surgeon came out. Okay. She's okay. Everything went fine. I talked to her dad. She's what, fine. Okay. She actually went out right after. No, she wasn't in surgery. Was right after? Yeah, she, the power went out right after we had finished. Okay. Thank goodness. Did you just come out from work? I just did. What's the situation in there? Uh, everything is calm. Uh, this is, seems to be a plan of action. Everybody, um, the elevators are down. Everybody's taking the stairs. But there's a lot of uh, direction as to where to go. What I saw today were people acting intelligently and courageously and, and with kindness and taking care of each other, directing traffic, looking out for one another. It was fantastic. Roosevelt, like the other hospitals in this city, are on backup power and they said that they'll be able to handle emergencies as long as they need to. Aaron Moriarty, thanks, thanks covering Dan. what's happening in the hospitals. You are watching combined coverage from CBS News special events and the CBS Evening News because of the massive power outages, a blackout, if you will, in a widespread section of the United States, the northeastern section, New York City, um, Detroit, Cleveland, Albany, Hartford affected some, on well up into Canada, Toronto, Ontario, Ontario province, said to be still without its basic sources of power. So that's the reason we're on the air with this kind of coverage. A kind of controlled chaos descended on New York City as the blackout spread, uh, overwhelming police and other agents of law and order, at least in the first seconds and minutes of this. But Richard Schlesinger found that many private citizens jumped into the breach. Kathy Donison is used to telling cranky, rushed people what to do in tough situations. Are you a police officer? No, I'm a teacher. How did you get into this? I came out and there was nobody directing traffic. Do you know, have you ever directed traffic before? No, I haven't. I teach high school. Yeah, what's easier? Huh? What's easier, that or this? Uh, 
They seem to listen to you. Huh? A lot of times they don't. Just like the high school. Mostly they do. They're amazingly cooperative, and most people are saying thank you. Okay. 79th and Amsterdam, for those who've never been to New York, is one of the busiest intersections in the city. Hello. Hang on, hang on. Sam, who I know from my building, came out with me, and uh, then somebody else joined us over there. So that's what's happening. She has no legal power, but she still has her own kind of authority. Okay, go. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, go. Go, go, go. Okay, stand right in the middle here. Okay. Guys. She's 52 years old and just had back surgery yesterday. But she's out there keeping her part of New York moving. I hate to tell you, but you're really in the way now. You have to go. You tell, oh, we have to go? Yeah. You know what? <laughs> I'm not arguing with you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, 79th and Amsterdam.